Okay, welcome to the first of the free BJCP prep course classes brought to you by barnleypotmaker.info. Uh, before we get started, I will tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about um, why we're going to be doing these classes. First, a little bit about me. Uh, there I am, so that you can put a face to the name. Um, I've been brewing since 2000 and I started out brewing extract with steeping grains and I did that for about four years before I moved to All Green in 2004. I um, First time I took the BJCP exam, it was back when they were doing the legacy exam, that was back in 2005. I'll be talking a little bit about the difference between the legacy and the current exam uh, today as a matter of fact, but I passed back then at the certified level. Uh, today I am a national judge and I am an exam grader. So um, I'm also the past president of the Manti Malters Homebrew Club. I'm the, right now I'm currently our, our webmaster and I handle our BJCP classes for our club, mantimalters.org. I should mention first of all that these classes that I'm doing here are not affiliated with the BJCP officially and it's also not um, affiliated with the mantimalters.org or the Manti Malters, but this is essentially all the same information that I give in our in our prep courses. I am also the author of BarleyPotMaker.info, the beer blog, um, author of the e-booklet Roasted, A Homebrewer's Guide to Home Roasting Grain, and the e-book Troubleshooting Methodology for Homebrew, both of which are available at Amazon.com. So let's talk a little bit about the course. Um, the main goal of this course is going to be to help give you the tools you needed to pass the online entrance, entrance exam and to pass the BJCP tasting exam. Uh, we will not be focusing on the written portion of the exam during this set of classes. Um, additional reading will be required if you're serious about taking the test. Um, the entrance exam is quite a bit tougher than people realize, but uh, you know they just think it's going to be easy, especially when they hear it's an open book format. But as you'll see in uh, course three, when we talk about the entrance exam, it is a little bit harder than, than uh, some people realize. Um, a lot of focus will be placed on filling out a score sheet properly. Uh, a lot of um, uh, you know, the ins and outs of filling out the score sheet for both the exam and when you're filling them out in a competition. There really should be no difference between the two. Will help you build your judging vocabulary and understand understand the main flaws that you will find in beer. Uh, we'll be discussing a lot of those off flavors, what causes them, and how to correct them. That'll come in handy when you need to provide feedback. We will also be learning about brewing ingredients and common mashing techniques, and we'll be learning how to properly read the guidelines. We'll be looking at both the 2008 and the new 2014 guidelines, although at the time that we're recording this, the 2014 guidelines are currently in the draft phase, but you'll get a good idea of what the new guidelines are going to look like. There are going to be some limitations to this uh, free prep course. Um, the first and most obvious is going to be um, tasting beers and tasting styles, and um, we won't be able to do any doctored beer labs. So normally we have those in um, a prep course like this, and obviously we can't do that because we don't have any face-to-face -face interaction or anything like that. So those you'll need to be conducted on your own through self-study. Uh, immediate feedback on any questions and lack of face-to-face -face interaction is, is definitely going to be a drawback to this type of, of class. Um, this course is meant to supplement independent study for those who don't have a BJCP prep course available. This isn't going to be intended to be your only um, portion to study in. This is just the uh, just a supplement to everything that you need to do. I will be uh, giving you some recommended reading, um, things like that. Also, a lot of times when you take a prep course, there is an exam right after the course is done. You will not have that. You'll you'll have to find your own testing site and request a seat and hopefully there's an open spot for you and you can take the exam then you can even you know study these videos that we're gonna that we're gonna put out and 
they'll help you in the long run. So it's not like information is a bad thing. So even if you don't get an opportunity to take take the exam right away, you know the information provided in this whole set will will help you with your brewing and and evaluating your own beers. Um, this course is also not intended, as I mentioned before, to prepare you for the written exam. The, you don't even really have to worry about that at this stage. If, if you haven't taken the exam at all, you need to first pass an entrance exam, then you need to take the uh, judging exam, and once you take the judging exam, if you score an 80 or higher, on the judging exam, then you qualify to be able to take the written exam. So um, we're not going to focus on the written exam. The goal is to get you through the entrance and the judging exam through this set of classes. So some of the topics we'll be discussing is the BJCP organization and advancement requirements. Those are what we're going to be covering today. So your first class is actually going to be today. Uh, we will be covering brewing processes and ingredients such as malt, hops, water, yeast. We'll be covering wort production and fermentation processes. We'll be very, very heavily focused on judging procedures, such as filling out score sheets, how to read the guidelines, and what to expect at competitions, and what to expect during your tests. Uh, in class three, we'll be studying the entrance exam, and then uh, a little later on, we'll be covering pretty heavily what to expect during the judging exam. So let's uh, get your pencils ready for taking notes if that's the type of thing you're into because we're going to get started right away and we're going to talk about the BJCP. So the BJCP is the Beer Judge Certification Program at www.bjcp.org. A lot of the information I'm going to give you today will be found in the um, study guide, the BJCP study guide, and it can be found right on the website. But uh, we're going to talk about it anyway. So the purpose of the BJCP is to promote beer literacy and appreciation of real beer and to recognize beer tasting and evaluation skills. That's pretty much all the BJCP does. A lot of people think um, all of your competitions are put on by the BJCP. They are not. The BJCP is mostly the, um, well, first of all, they'll sanction it, which means that the the event is going to use some form of guidelines. It does not have to be the BJCP guidelines, but the competition does have to have guidelines, and there are some other um, sets of rules that a competition needs to abide by in order to be sanctioned by the BJCP. And um, part of that will be that there's going to be an effort made to use BJCP judges, judges that have been qualified by at a certain rank um, for the uh, for the uh, evaluation skills that, that a judge should should have. So it doesn't mean that every judge will be a BJCP judge, but they make an effort to at least have one qualified judge at the table if there's enough judges available. Um, to do well, you will need to study outside of this course. That I, that I promise you. You're going to have to do some reading if you haven't done so already. And I'm, I'll put together some uh, general recommended reading materials for some some modern books that are out there some of the BJCP uh, recommended reading is a little dated uh, right now I can tell you there's there's four four books I really think every brewer should read especially if you're going to be a judge and that is the the brewers um, or the uh, brewing elements series from brewers publications the the water book the malt book that just came out the book on hops and the book on yeast; those are those are uh, pretty big ones. You should also read uh, *How to Brew* by John Palmer, and um, maybe even *Tasting Tasting Beer* by uh, Randy Mosier. I know that's six books, but those first four books, those *Brewing Elements* series, is going to give you a lot of knowledge as far as being able to provide feedback on your your uh, your score sheets. A lot of the sensory stuff, you you can just you can develop that on your own through. Uh, doing your own doctored beer labs, tasting a lot of beer, um, reading the um, commercial calibration and Zymergy, finding those those same beer styles uh, that those judges are are tasting. And although not every beer is going to be exactly the same, you're going to get a general idea of, 
on, on what they're finding if you can find those same commercial beers and read through those commercial calibrations in Synergy. So the legacy exam, which I talked about earlier, uh, ended in 2012 and the new version took its place. Um, the legacy exam was a written exam and the tasting exam all in one. So you had to do, it was a three hour basically written essay exam uh, took uh, it was three hours long, ten questions. Plus, you had to evaluate four beers. You were interrupted through the course of your your uh, writing your essays to evaluate four different beers. Uh, guidelines were were not allowed, just as they are today. And basically, you did your written and your tasting portion all in one. Today, you just have to take the entrance exam, uh, proving that you have um, above average knowledge of beer evaluation and beer beer brewing science and then you get to take the judging exam which evaluates your palate. To get to national and certified you need to then take the written exam and pass at an 80 percent or, or higher. Uh, it's 90 percent or higher for master, 80 percent or higher for national. So the steps to becoming a judge are, follow, are as follows. You'll first take the online entrance, entrance exam. It provides instant pass-fail results you'll be you'll then uh, once you pass that you'll take the BJCP 90 minute tasting exam and that's where you'll uh, receive your rank of apprentice recognized or certified uh, you'll be scoring six beers and no style guidelines are allowed uh, you also will not know ahead of time what beers beer styles will be represented so you're gonna show up and they're gonna say judge this beer as German Pilsner, judge this beer as an American Pale Ale, judge this beer as a, as a uh, Russian Imperial Stout, you know, for example. Um, so once you pass the tasting exam at an 80% or higher, you will then be allowed to take the 90 minute, 90 minute written exam to achieve your national and master ranks. Um, right now there's a 50-50 weight ratio between the written and tasting exams once you take that uh, before um, the legacy exam w uh, was weighted at 70 30 between the uh, between the tasting and the written portion so right now once you once you take um, the if you get to the point where you take are able to take the written exam the percentage score of your tasting exam and the percentage score of your written exam are weighed exactly the same for your total overall score. So let's talk a little bit about the entrance, entrance exam. We'll be covering it in, in more detail in class three, but just so you have a general idea of what it's about, it's not scored. It's basically a pass-fail. So you'll take this 200, 200 question test. Uh, it's all multiple choice um, or true-false, and if you do well enough to pass at 70% or higher, you pass the test. If it doesn't matter if you score 90 or if you score 70, it's just pass fail. And once you pass, you're allowed to take the the judging exam. It's 200 questions and it's 60 minutes and it costs you $10 to take the exam. As I said, it's all multiple choice, true, false, and multiple answer questions. Um, the topics that are covered are all the technical aspects of brewing, such as ingredients, brewing process, and um, any possible faults. You know, they do talk about uh, brewing faults and maybe you need to know what caused it or what this fault tastes like and you'll have um, you'll have to choose through multiple choice what you know say diacetyl tastes like or things like that you know, it also covers world beer styles including the char characteristics history uh, maybe it might ask what ingredients are appropriate in this style and um, brewing techniques may have some questions on mashing or hopping rates and things like that. The The purpose of the BJCP will be asked and the criteria for judging ranks are some of the questions that will also be um, talk, or asked in the entrance exam. Uh, judging procedure and ethics will be covered as well as um, as well as uh, judging processes that you know normally take place at the table. A lot of like uh, what if type of questions, you know, what would be the best scenario for, you know, this happens at your table, what do you do here? And you'll have a multi, uh, set of multiple choice questions to pick 
the best a answer of what what you would do in that situation. After completing the exam, pass or fail, you will receive a report on areas for improvement. So, you know, if you get like 80% and most of the ones you missed were on style, it'll tell you you need to maybe study your sty style guidelines a little better and become a little more familiar with, with styles. After passing, you'll receive a certificate and you'll need that certificate in order to take the tasting exam. You'll be able to reserve a seat at, at a site say um, somebody's got an opening at their at their judging exam site you can request a seat uh, normally they'll hold it for you but when you show up to take the judging exam you'll have to provide them with that certificate proving that you've taken the tasting exam otherwise you won't be allowed to take the tasting exam after you pass you have one year to register and take the tasting exam before you need to retake the entrance exam you know that's I've heard in some cases they're, they've been a little lenient on that. If you are not able to find a site and say it's like a, a year and two months before you can get in, uh, a lot of times they might waive that, that one year requirement, but you definitely aren't going to be able to wait like two years or a year and a half after passing to take the judging exam. So the judging exam once you pass the entrance exam is a lot of people call it the tasting exam at six beers and you do that you have 90 minutes to complete six beers and that sounds like a lot of time that's about 15 minutes per beer um, but you'll find you could be a little pressed for time in that um, you know first of all you're, you're taking the exam so you want to be as thorough as possible and that 15 minutes per beer when you're trying to smell it taste it looking at it getting a mouthfeel, gauging maybe what may be right or wrong with it, and writing all that stuff down, at 15 minutes goes really fast. So it, it you know, it is a little more, uh, there's a little more pressure to it than, than what you may think right off the bat when you see that you have an hour and a half to do six beers. So, like I said, that's 15 minutes per beer. No style guidelines are allowed in for test takers. I believe the uh, proctors are allowed to have the, um, style guidelines but uh, as far as the uh, being a test taker all you can bring in with you normally is just a pencil and some sites will even provide that for you you can't bring anything in a uh, pencil and maybe a calculator uh, for and it's got to be a basic calculator you can't can't bring your cell phone in with you to use it use uh, as a calculator they'll have you know the old style all you can do on it add subtract multiply divide things like that it will be proctored by judges that have access to the style guidelines and all the proctors need to be of a national rank or higher. So that is who you're being gauged against. Uh, normally there's two to three proctors and the graders will look at what the proctors have to say and they'll find, um, a lot of times they'll find the common thread between maybe what they're saying and the aroma, appearance, flavor. And those are all the things that generally you must have on your guidelines. So if all three proctors say that this beer is oxidized and has a stale papery cardboard type flavor to it and you don't pick that up you might get dinged for for missing that flaw so um, you know that can come back to bite you if, if you're thinking you're gonna you're gonna play the system and you're gonna try to throw some flaws out there maybe that aren't in there you know that it works the other way too if, if nobody else is saying that they get diacetyl in this beer and you're like oh it's a full of diacetyl I can hardly drink it that's uh, that's gonna ding against you too so your best bet when taking the judging exam is to just judge the beer that's in front of you the best that you can and just trust your senses and and be honest about it uh, like I said it's much harder than it sounds like a lot of times so you tell somebody you know I'm taking the tasting exam and I gotta drink six beers in an hour and a half it doesn't sound like a big deal but you you put that score sheet in front of most people and uh, They'll, they'll have a very hard time filling out all the lines so really work your palate work your your, uh, your vocabulary uh, for descriptors and uh, you shouldn't have a problem from that point so you also want to make sure you have complete feedback all lines are filled in in every section and not just with fluff like oh this delicious beer tastes very good and it's going to you know stuff like that you want to be concise you know talk about you know the malt, you know, you could say the malt profile in this beer is very caramely 
uh, bready with maybe some biscuit notes to it and then you're going to talk about the hops and then you're going to you know talk about um, what type what type of aroma you get from the hops or flavor is it spicy is it earthy is it piney is it citrusy you know what level high medium low and um, talk about the esters and there's a lot you can talk about even if things are are not in there you know very clean profile no esters no diacetyl so once you start do, f learning how to fill out a score sheet in that way filling in all the lines isn't going to be very difficult and the judging exam is also uh, graded on content quality accuracy uh, your number score accuracy how closely your score matches up with the proctor scores uh, feedback relevance uh, what that means is you could provide a, a feedback as far as um, let's say you pick up some diacetyl and you tell them in order to clear up diacetyl you want you want to um, you know add more hops to cover up that diacetyl that's not relevant feedback that's not accurate that's not how you want to tell them tell a, a, an entrant how to fix their beer so your feedback needs to be relevant and accurate and you should have some knowledge about the style um, if say you get a, you get a um, Bavarian wheat and you know comes across brown you know tell the entrant that it's it's a little dark for style this this the color should be you know a little more to the yellow and orange side than brown so having some knowledge about the style what the style should taste like is, is really going to help you out in the judging exam and for most judges this is the only test that they they'll take they a lot of judges don't have a lot of interest in taking the written exam so if they score well enough to get to the certified level and they're happy with that so that's why the entrance exam is, is fairly tough and the judging exam went to six beers so that you can grade that entrance um, ability to, to describe a beer and articulate what they're tasting in six beers and that's you can't really judge how well a person can fill out a score sheet off one or two score sheets you know, across six if they're fairly consistent you know that they're they're going to have fairly consistent score sheets but you know when you start grading them you can see some some people will have like one excellent score sheet and then several mediocre ones so you know a lot of people say why don't they just go off one beer you just can't judge somebody's ability to articulate what they're tasting off of one score sheet um, the average according to the BJCP website the average tasting exam score is 73.1 so that's that's a certified level so that means quite a few people have scored higher say they scored anywhere in the 90s the 80s or they scored quite a bit lower 50s you know at the failing level or 60s um, so that's 73.1 that is the average and for those that may be retaking the exam the average retake exam uh, score increases by five points on average uh, you know some people have increased their score 15 to 20 um, in in one you, you know one retake but you know on average you're going to increase your score by roughly five five points so the points rundown uh, when you're when you become a judge points become uh, fairly important you are going to um, you're going to want to accumulate what are called either judging points or non-judging points. This is how you advance aside from aside from your test score in the BJCP. Um, so judging points are points you get for either judging competition or judging in best of show. That's it. That's the only way that you get judging points. To advance in most ranks, half of your points need to be judging points. The other half can be non-judging points. Non-judging points are points that you get for either being an organizer of a competition, being a steward at a competition, um, being a part of any of the other the competition staff, you know, seller master or you know the the guy or gal who puts um, mailing labels on the on the the letters, you know, going back to the entrance. Um, also organizing classes like like well not like this one this was uh, actually a slide I took from my uh, 
BJCP class uh, for our homebrew club, but if you organize classes uh, for um, for advancing judging knowledge, say through your your homebrew club or you know through another another group of judges, you do get non-judging points for for um, continuing education programs. So, like I said, half of your points to advance need to be judging points to move from like say recognized and certified and so on. So these are the typical point assessments that you'll get per competition. You normally will get one point minimum per competition that you sit at a table at. Um, that means if, you, if you're requested to judge at a competition and you sit at one table, you judge one flight of beers, in most cases you're going to get one point. You'll also get one point if you judge two flights of beers or you judge three. A lot of times you just get one point um, for the day per competition. Uh, at the discretion of the organizer, you can get up to one and a half points if the organizer has enough points to give out. They, at their discretion, they can give you one and a half points per day maximum. If you are lucky enough to judge in best of show, which judging in best of show is, is a ton of fun, uh, that's where you get to judge um, all of the winners from each flight and then you just pick the best beer of the day. Uh, a lot of times there's very spirited uh, discussion about which beers deserve to be, especially once you get into the top three. So normally, uh, if you are judging in best of show, you get a ha another half point. So if you got one point for the day and then you get to sit at a best of show table, you will get one and a half points. Uh, the number of best of show judges allowed is determined by how many entries there are into the best of show. So normally, um, five to fourteen entries. There's they're going to allow three best of show judges that can get points. I have been to some competitions that have had five best of show judges, or even more, but only three can get points. So a lot of times they'll say, you know, who wants to sit at the best of show table? But you know, you won't. You might not get points. Um, Three best of show judges are allowed to sit at a table for the, for the mead and cider categories, between three to fourteen entries, and then if you get into fifteen and fifteen and up uh, categories that that are representing into a best of show round, uh, five best of show judges are allowed to receive points. Um, stewards uh, normally get half a point to one ju non-judging point per day with a maximum of one point per competition. So if you're steward stewarding a competition, depending on the rules of the competition, you'll get either a half point for that day or you'll get a full point. Uh, other staff normally gets a half point per, per competition. Um, they get uh, the total points is, is, normally, is normally assigned by the organizer in accordance with, with uh, the number of entries because a lot of the time the staff that's you know aside from the stewarding say if they're the seller master the um, amount of points that they'll get will be directly um, related to how many beers they're actually handling so you know for a small competition of 1 to 49 entries you know they'll get one one point um, 500, 500 en entries that's a pretty big competition there's a lot of beer to be handled in a, in a 500 entry you know that's two two to three bottles per per entry so that's a thousand bottles that that person may be handling they can get up to eight points according to the the BJCP for a competition of that size so and and eight points is that's very significant as far as um, needing your totals to to advance organizers are the only program participants that can receive organizer points I mean that that makes sense, but they state that in the BJCP, so I wanted to state it here. Um, and organizer points are non-judging points. Uh, those points um, are allocated. Those are also based on the total number of competition entries. Um, there's a two-point minimum, so if you if you are um, if you're the organizer for a one to forty-nine entry, you know, very small competition, you're going to get two non-judging points. Um, six points is the maximum that you can earn as an organizer and that would be like for your 500 um, entry competitions 
you know, for if you need to know more on points, this is just the rundown. Um, you're going to want to refer to the study guide, and pages nine through twelve cover everything you need to know about ju uh, judging and non-judging points. And that can be downloaded from the the BJCP website. So you're probably wondering how many points do I need to advance once I once I pass the exam and let's say I score a 75 and I'm starting out at zero you are going once you pass the exam in order to be an apprentice judge which I, I believe this this rank is kind of being uh, weaned out of the out of the BJCP uh, but that basically you pass the judging exam with a score of less than 60 uh, you don't need any points to achieve the apprentice rank so you'll if you score less than 60 and you have zero points, you start out at the apprentice rank. Most people are going to start out at the recognized rank, no matter whether you scored a 90 or you scored, you know, a, a 62. Your first rank is going to be recognized. You need zero points to achieve the recognized rank, and you need to score on your judging exam a score of 60 to 69 points or percent. Once you, so that's right where you're going to enter your boom. You're a recognized judge right off the bat. So let's say you scored a 75. Well, you still start out at recognized if you have zero points and you've never judged a competition before. Uh, if you scored, say, a 75, you're in that range of 70 to 79 that somebody needs to achieve the certified rank, but you have zero points. So you'll need to judge at at least a minimum of two competitions that would be one competition just as a judge one competition as a judge and then maybe you get called to do a best of show table it's fairly rare for a very inexperienced judge to be called to the best of show table but it could happen and you would have two and a half points so then your other two and a half points could be from uh, maybe you stewarded a couple of competitions prior and you have say you have two and a half points accumulated from earlier competitions, stewarding or being other staff, then you have your five points and you will achieve the certified rank. If you have zero points and you've never helped out at a competition before, you're probably going to have to judge in about four or five competitions before you get your five points needed to achieve that rank, even if you scored um, 75. So you need some experience points to achieve the certified level. Let's just say you scored, you got, you know, you scored very well on your your judging exam, and you scored an, you scored an 83. Well, you're still the highest, the highest rank you're going to be able to achieve is going to be certified, even if you scored an 82 or 83. Um, even if you've accumulated these 20 points, you're still only going to be certified. I shouldn't say only, but you're still going to be at the certified rank even if you scored an 82 because in order to get to national you need to have um, a combined judging exam and written score with an average of 80 to 89 percent or more and you also need 20 20 points half of which need to be judging points but all I'm trying to stress is if you do very well on your judging exam sit in the 80s or even in the 90s you're still only going to be able to get to the certified level unless you take the written exam. But let's say you score an 80, an 80 on the judging exam and you score an 82 on the written exam. That'll give you an average of 81. Then you will achieve the national rank once you get 20, you accumulate 20, 20 points, half of which, like I said, need to be judging points to get to master. It's the same process as national, except you need to achieve a combined score of 90% or higher between the written and judging exam, and you need 40 points, half of which, of course, need to be judging points to get to the master master level. To get to grandmaster, you need the same exact criteria as, as um, the master except for you need that you get to Grandmaster once you accumulate 100 
judging points. So there's quite a few competitions. Or you just need to judge quite a few competitions and organize or be staff members on, on many competitions. Just some current statistics on active judges at the time that I put this together. At the time I put this presentation together, there was 444 apprentice judges. They're trying to get all of these apprentice judges to retake the exam. I don't think they have to retake the entrance exam, but you have to retake the judging exam, and I think they're given two years to retake the exam and try to get to the recognized judging level. There's 1,728 recognized judges, 1,773 certified judges, 615 national judges, and 102 master through grandmaster eight judges and honorary masters. Uh, sometimes the honorary master rank is for officers of the BJCP who are currently holding office, but maybe they hold the national rank and they're given uh, honorary master uh, titles while they're serving as, a, as an officer of the BJCP. So, the style guidelines are your lifeline. We're going to cover these in a lot more depth later on, but right now we're just going to breeze over this. There are print copies available that you can purchase from the BJCP website. You can download a PDF or Word version from the BJCP website, and here I'm providing you with the URL if you want to write it down. Otherwise, you can just go to www.bjcp.org, click on, uh, I think there's a style guideline link. You can just click right on it, and it'll take you to, there's a, there's a web version, or you can uh, download one of these versions. There's also some apps for either the, the phone or your, your tablet, and they have both iPhone and Android apps available. I think there may even be a BlackBerry version available if, um, if you still have a BlackBerry phone. So you'll want to download a copy as soon as possible. Uh, we'll cover how to properly read them and use the guidelines in a later course, but it will not hurt you at all to start reading through these guidelines. There's a lot of information in there that you're going to need to cram and retain in your brain. So on judging day, what can you expect? Well, you're going to be doing a formalized evaluation of beer, basically. That's, that's, all, that's all your job is. So you need to accomplish three things. You need to provide feedback to the brewer, either on how to improve their beer or maybe what their beer tastes like, what their beer smells like, what their beer feels like, what it looks like, and your overall impression. You need to provide the brewer with some troubleshooting advice. If they get, if you're picking up diacetyl in their beer, you're going to have to tell them how to correct that issue. Or if their beer kind of misses the mark on style a little bit, you're going to want to give them a few, a few pointers on maybe what they can do to tweak their beer to, to, you know, drive it home a little bit more, right and in, right, right into that style. Um, formalized evaluation also provides an unbiased method for selecting and recognizing outstanding beers in competition against other beers in that same class. Um, for example, you're going to be looking at, say you're looking at dry stouts. You're going to be comparing, the, according to the guidelines, you say anywhere from you know 3 to 12 different dry stouts and you're going to be recognizing which one exemplifies that style a little better than the rest. It can be a, it can be a little bit difficult and trying at times. You know, a lot of a lot of people think judging is just drinking beer all day and saying, "Oh, this is a good one." Well, there's a it can it can it can be difficult at times, especially if you've got a lot of good beers at your table and you need to differentiate which one is is uh, just a cut above the rest. In a formalized evaluation, environment is important. You're going to want a well-lit, odor-free, and distraction-free environment. You know, you're not going to want to hold this at dance club. I mean, I don't know of any any uh, competitions that would be held at a place like that, but you want the judges to be able to focus on the beer. Um, odor-free, that, that one's a little difficult because a lot of competitions are held either at a homebrew store, uh, a brewery, or 
a bar or restaurant. There's usually food and other beers being served, and uh, some states probably still allow smoking in uh, inside of uh, bars and restaurants. So you may have cigarette or cigar smoke that can that can really hamper your style. I know there was one case one time where somebody um, was having it at a bar and they had a, a popcorn machine right behind where the judges were trying to evaluate these beers and an employee went in put popcorn in the popcorn popper and started popping up a bunch of popcorn and that was not a good situation for trying to evaluate beers you're going to want uh, some natural uh, diffuse lighting which is which is best if you got a lot of windows but i know uh that's not it's not always the case in, in uh in a commercial establishment incandescent lighting is preferred over fluorescent lighting but again beggars can't be choosers I mean, I'm just telling you what's ideal and sometimes what's ideal isn't always what's available comfort is is a very important uh, part of formalized evaluation I've been to competitions where, where you're tight in elbow to elbow to other judges and it just it's, it's just very difficult and it's very trying on your body to try to keep yourself so rigid you know comfortable chairs get, having enough elbow room to be able to move it'll do wonders for how long you can evaluate beer throughout the day but uh, if you're all cramped and everything's tight and your chairs falling apart and, uh, I've had those situations before too and it just it's very difficult to sit in those in those places for a couple hours at a time some equipment you're going to want to pick up for judging some of the stuff will be provided by the competition but it never hurts to have your own two to three mechanical pencils with your racers you're going to want to you know maybe you change some feedback you need to change some numbers you're going to need some erasers mechanical pencils are great because you don't need to use a pencil sharpener some people are sensitive to the smell of pencil shavings so using a mechanical pencil eliminates that i i personally prefer uh, regular pencil and uh, I do bring regular pencils with me and I'll ask the judge that I'm sitting with if if uh, pencil shavings bother them or if they can even smell them or not most people don't have a problem but I have had a couple people that they can smell pencil shavings from a mile away and so in that, those cases I'll use the mechanical pencils occasionally competitions provide pencils and erasers but that is something you definitely should bring with you clear cups uh, made of an odor-free plastic. Glass is ideal. I, I only judge at one competition. Every year they have glass. Actually, la this year I was at a one competition for the first time and they they had um, little mini tulip glasses, which was which was nice. Uh, you got to take that back with you when you were done, but glass is ideal, but most competitions are using uh, the clear odor-free plastic cups. They must be clear. That's very important because you're evaluating appearance. You can't evaluate appearance through an opaque or translucent cup. It's got to be transparent. The cup has to be able to hold two to three ounces. And I'd say ten times out of ten, the glasses are provided by the competition. You're going to want to have copy and style guidelines. I like to bring um, a tablet with me, just a small. I have a Kindle tablet. I have my guidelines on there. It's compact. I can fit all the guidelines on this small little little tablet. A lot of times competitions will have paper copies for you. If you have a digital copy, by all means use it. Um, occasionally, like I said, the paper copies are provided by the competition. But style guidelines are something you definitely want to bring with you. Score sheets are always provided by the competition. But if you have some extras in your judging kit, it doesn't hurt to have some. Some other essentials. These are normally provided by the competition. Would be water, bread and crackers, preferably with no salt, um, a bucket for dumping and for gushers, a towel for gushers, bottle openers. Um, you might want to have one in your judging kit. Uh, a lot of times the competition will provide you with bottle openers. Um, in my judging kit, I have one flashlight for getting a good close look at, at uh, clarity especially if I'm in some dimmer lighting conditions I have hay fever so I have an allergy tablet in my in my judging kit I have just a basic calculator I have an SRM color guide which you you will get after you pass the judging exam 
the BJCP Send Zone card to you in your kit. Um, I have pencils. I have both regular pencils, which are like I said, are the ones I prefer, and I have mechanical pencils. You should have your BJCP ID, and you should have a copy of the guidelines. So judging process. There's two methods of um, presentation of beers. This is the way that the steward will pour your beer for you. The two methods are the steward brings a beer to the table and the judges pour. This is the most common. The drawback can be that uh, there might be some rousing of the yeast um, because you're, you're pouring and if you don't hold that bottle at the same angle when you hand it off to the other judge or if you don't pour two or three samples yourself you could be stirring up some yeast. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bottle appearance. Say um, this should not affect your judging, but for some people it does. If um, there's a label still stuck to the bottle, label residue, the bottle's dirty looking on the outside, maybe you see a pellicle in the neck of the bottle, a lot of times that can influence a judge into thinking that maybe this beer is not going to be that great because this guy doesn't, guy or girl doesn't really care that much about their, their cleaning process. That's why when you do send a beer off to competition as an entrant, you're going to want to make sure your bottles look really nice. It should not impact flavor and aroma, but again, a lot of times people make preconceived notions before before they even taste it. So you want your bottle to look nice. The advantage is that the judge gets to immediately capture aromas and other volatile compounds that dissipate very quickly immediately after the pour. A judge, the judges can always recap the beer when they're done. The second method is that the steward pours the beer into a pitcher and brings the beer to the table. I've personally never been to a competition that been to a competition that's done this, but I've heard there are some places that that do do this. Uh, the drawbacks are that the judge cannot evaluate the bottle fill, and some of the aroma compounds are lost from the time that the steward pours the bottle into a pitcher and then pours that into your pours it into your glass. Uh, you also cannot easily store leftover beer for mini best to show. Uh, let's say you have two or three beers in your flight that you're kind of on the fence about about which one is better than the other. A lot of times you want to go back and taste those. So that's almost impossible with the pitcher method. The advantage is of course that that bottle appearance, uh, any label residue or anything like that is not an influence for the judges. Now there's two methods two main methods of scoring decision strategy. The first is top-down, the second is bottom-up. There's actually a third, which is what most judges use, and that's actually a combination of the two. In a top-down approach, the judge comes up with an overall score for the beer based on overall impression, and they assign, assign scores to each component individually. So that means you're going to smell, you're going to write down your comments, you're going to look at it, you're going to taste it, write down all your comments, take in the mouthfeel, write down your comments, do your overall impression section, write down the comments, and then you decide this beer to me is a 35. So then you're going to write 35 in the overall score and then distribute the points as you see fit between mouthfeel, flavor, appearance, and aroma. The next is bottom-up. And bottom-up judging the judge assigns a score to each component individually. You say you swirl the beer, you smell it, write down your write down your comments, and you think, oh, out of 12 points, I think this beer is a seven. Then they go to appearance, do the same thing for appearance, do the same thing for flavor, mouthfeel, overall impression. Then they add them up and see what they got. The drawback to this is that the overall score may not always mesh with the comments. You may end up with an overall score of 40, because you're judging each one individually, but the comments may say things like you need to improve here, improve there. Um, the drawback with the top-down approach, the first one we talked about, is that the assigned number score for each component may not jive with the comment. So while you're giving it a 35 overall, which may be accurate, you may not be doing the flavor justice or the aroma justice. The combination of the two is most common. Most people use this. What they'll do is they'll start with a bottom-up approach. Is they will assign a score under each each individual section, and 
they'll say uh, a beer ends up, let's say it's score of 40, like I'm talking about here. But you don't, you don't really feel that beer is a 40. You think it's actually, um, it's actually, um, you know, needs to score a little lower. So you reevaluate the number and say, you know, this, this really isn't a 40 point beer. It's more of a 30 or a 35. So then you you'll make adjustments. That's why a lot of times you'll see uh, eraser marks on a uh, score sheet because maybe one of two things happened. Either the judge got to the end, they tallied up their score and said, boy, you know, for the overall number score, it's a little, it's a little high. Or during a discussion with the judge across from them, they had to come to a consensus on on a number score within a certain range, and they'll discuss things they liked about the beer, things they didn't like about the beer, to come up with a consensus. And sometimes a person either needs to go up or go down in those cases. So scoring. All beers are scored on a 50-point scale. You get 12 points for aroma, 3 points for appearance, 20 points for flavor, 5 points for mouthfeel, and 10 points for overall impression. Your ranges are, these are this is total total score for, for a beer. You're going to score a beer that's a truly world-class example of the beer style, 45 to 50. So that means between aroma, appearance, flavor, mouthfeel, and overall impression, those numbers all add up to 50. 45 to 50. An excellent representation of the style will be in the 38 to 44 point range. A good, a very good representation of the style, meaning it has, you know, some minor flaws, you know, very light diacetyl, or maybe the very light uh, DMS where DMS isn't allowed in that style, or it's maybe slightly too dark or slightly too bitter, that will be your 30 to 37 point beer. A 21 to 29 point beer is a, it's a good beer. It, it tastes good, but it might have some significant flaws. It might be, you know, fairly bitter. It could, it could have a significant amount of DMS. It could have some diacetyl in it. You know, the, that it's not an off-putting level, but it's a definite, definitely noticeable flaw. It's noticeable, but it's not to the point where, where you're like, eh, I can hardly drink this. A 14 to 20 point beer is a beer that either doesn't adequately represent the style or there's some serious flaws. Uh, you know, there's maybe it's it's extremely buttery or it's, you know, it's just very astringent, hard to drink. It could be sour. Um, those would be a 14 to 20 point beer or a beer that's entered incorrectly in a category. That happens. So somebody may be entering more than one beer and they just get their labels mixed up. And let's say they enter a, in the American Brown category and you're tasting something that's more like a dry stout, that should that should be a 14 to 20 point beer because it does not adequately represent the style. Now, typically 13 is the bottom where most people, most judges will, will score a beer. If you get a 13 point beer, that it's basically a zero for the most part. Um, those those scores are typically assigned to beers that contain flaws that are that are so serious that the beer is pretty much undrinkable. You usually don't have a whole lot of those. You might might have one per competition, maybe two in the whole competition that are that seriously off. But thirteen is is normally the the lowest score that that you give to those. Um, these ranges are not gospel. Some some groups tend to score more generously than others by region. Uh, I've found that on the on the west coast, it doesn't matter how hoppy your beer is, they always want more hops. You could put a pound of hops in that beer, and they're gonna say, "Oh, could use more hops. Could use more hops." In the Midwest, that same beer it could be in, could be a forty five. You know, it it happens. It's there's there's a culture in different areas, even some. Some uh, homebrew clubs seem to have a whole group of guys that don't like any beer, period. I don't know what it is, but every beer sucks, except for their own, of course. So um, you will have some cases where, you know, some regions may be a little more, a little more strict, a little more 
lenient. So if you get a 40, 45 point beer, you, you know you've got a really good beer, but if you send it off to another part of the country and it comes back as a 35, hey, it, it, it's anything above 30 is, is a very good, very good score to have. <clears throat> Typically, a competition will have what they call a courtesy score, like what I was talking about with a 13 or less. Um, it's a score that has been agreed upon at the competition. You won't go below. So you may not even see a 13. They, you know, they may tell you as a courtesy score, our lowest score today is going to be a 15. Um, the reason they do that is, is a beer that's, that's scored at a 15 or 19 is typically has no chance of placing. You're not going to win a medal at, if you, if you have a 20 point beer. But they don't. You don't want to completely discourage a brewer by by saying, "Oh, this is a five point beer." You know, you you give them a fifteen, you give them some points, and then you, in the feedback, you just make sure you tell them this beer had some significant flaws. It needs to be corrected. Here's how to correct them. A general rule of thumb on scoring is um, when providing feedback about uh, very good beers, it's important to identify, you know, ways in which the beer can be improved. Unless you score a beer at forty five or higher, you should always give some type of feedback, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, adjusting the hop schedule or it's adjusting, um, you know, the malt, the grain bill, maybe, maybe it needs to be mashed a little, a little lower. Um, maybe fermentation temperature was a little off. It was a little, a little bit too many esters in there, you know, adjusting the, the temperature. So you always want to mention a way that they can improve a beer because if a beer did not score a 45 or higher, there's got to be a reason why it didn't get a perfect score. So tell them, no matter how minor it is, because once you get to that 40-point range, any flaw or anything that you are holding it back, it's pretty minor at that point. It's just, you know, nitpicking. And those very good beers that are in those 40s, you need to nitpick them to, you know, it's very rare that you have the perfect 50-point beer, which is what I'm going to talk about now. A 50-point beer must have absolutely no flaws. It must exemplify the style as well or better than the best commercial examples. It must be perfectly brewery fresh, which a lot of times that's that's what that's what's lacking is that brewery fresh um, character, and it must be well handled and presented. That's completely out of your hands if you're an entrant. You know, if your beer shows up at the doorstep of a competition. And they put it right in a refrigerator, store it, store it up, don't move it around. It's it's being handled very well. Sometimes, you know, you ship your beer across the country. It's hot. It's being thrown around, especially in the summer. You know, it's hot. UPS, FedEx, throwing, throwing these boxes around. Everything's getting shaken up. It's getting hot. It's getting abused. A lot of times the beer you have in your fridge is not always the beer that's at the judge's table. So that's something you need to realize. But... <clears throat> something else I need to mention is that the classic examples listed in the guidelines are not examples of 50 point beers you cannot look at, at any commercial example that's in the guidelines and say that's a 50 point beer because each one of those beers is different but the reason those beers are in there is because they exemplify the style very well they're typically 40, 40 to 50 point beers if they're in the right conditions so, some people think that any beer that's in the classic examples is automatically the perfect beer, and that's not the case. So, we're going to be heading into the home stretch here on the fi final part of the first class. We're going to talk about judging a beer. This is an overview of the procedure. The beer should be evaluated using the following procedure. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we are going to cover this in later classes. You're going to want to prepare the score sheet. Fill out all your judging information, your name, your email address, your judging ID, the beer category, the entry number. Then you're going to inspect the bottle for to make sure it's to the proper fill level. It has no pellicle or it has one if it's a if it's a sour it it may have a pellicle, you can make note of it. And that the beer does not have excessive sediment in the bottom. You're then going to want to pour the beer aggressively enough to, to get a good head or gentle enough for if it's a one of the higher carbonated styles like like a hefe, like a, a you know like a Bavarian wheat or, or anything like that you know wanna pour it a little more gently 
Then you're going to smell the beer. You do this immediately after pouring because some volatile compounds are, are lost right away. So then you're going to warm the sample in your hand if needed by holding the cup in your hand. Swirl it and you're going to want to note any off flavors or aromas that jump out at you those first couple seconds. Then you're going to visually inspect the beer. Look at the head, look at the color, clarity, lacing, tight bubbles, big bubbles, um, you know, the texture of the head, you know, how hazy the beer is, the color, all that stuff. Look at that, make note of it. Then you're going to want to go back and smell the beer again. You're going to note any um, appropriateness, flavors, as appropriate flavors, such as the, uh, the malt. You know, you're going to want to make note of the type of malt you're smelling. Is it bready? Is it biscuity? Caramelly? The level. Is it, is it very malty? Is it, is it, is it a, is there a high maltiness to it? Low? Medium? You know, the, the hop aroma. Is it grassy? Citrusy? Is it piney? Is it earthy? Uh, any yeast derived uh, esters or, or phenolics? Any other fermentation byproducts um, should also be noted. You know, whether it's got a, uh, a green apple flavor to it or anything like that. Then you're going to want to taste the beer. Coat the inside of your mouth with the beer. Be sure it hits the lips, the gums, gets, gets all in your mouth so you can hit every flavor receptor that's in, in your mouth. You get the full experience of the beer. Then you're going to swallow and exhale through the nose. Um, that exhaling through the nose, you do get some aroma that way but you also tend to get a good gauge of alcohol by breathing out through the nose after you swallow. Um, generally anything that's six, seven percent or higher when you swallow and breathe out through the nose, you're going to get, you're going to get a good, a good, uh, alcohol, uh, sensation through the nose. Um, also through here, you're also going to want to taste malt, hops, alcohol, sweetness, any other intermediate flavors, um, say fruitiness, diacetyl, any sourness, and then the aftertaste, you know, you're going to pay attention to the hot bitterness, the sweetness, the malt levels, any oxidation, astringency. Then you're going to score the mouthfeel. Take another sip, pay attention to how the beer feels in your mouth. You know, is, is it is it heavy in body, medium, or is it very light and watery? Is there any astringency? Does it have a creamy texture to it? Um, how high is the carbonation? Is is it very prickly on your tongue, or, or does it seem fairly flat? You're going to want to make notes of all that and score appropriately. And In the end, you're going to take a look at the whole, the whole beer. Taste the beer again. Take in the whole experience, the aroma, the flavor, the mouthfeel, and get a good gauge of where that beer belongs. Is it excellent? Is it, is it good? Is it very good? Is it fair? And mentally compare this beer where it, re, where it resides on a scale not only as far as the commercial examples you've had, but the other beers that are in the flight. Next, you're going to want to check any of the flaw boxes on the left to, um, if you noticed any diacetyl or any, any other off flavors on the left side of your check box, check those boxes. You're going to want to check the style um, accuracy uh, check boxes on the bottom of the score sheet. And then, uh, Check over your score sheet. Make sure the scores all add up properly. Make sure you're happy with the overall score and the number of scores for each component. Check your stylistic accuracy. Double check to make sure you got your check boxes. And make sure everything is filled out fully. Boom. Done. Move on to the next beer. So here's some suggested reading. We're closing out the class now for today. You're going to want to download and start reading the BJCP guidelines. Download and maybe start reading the BJCP study guide. These first couple classes, we're going to focus on the entrance exam. Next class is going to be all on filling out a score sheet. And then after that, we're going to get started on water, malt, hops, brewing processes. We're going to cover all that. So make sure you start di diving into that BJCP study guide. And like I said, next class, we're covering score sheets. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, we're just over an hour for our first class, which is pretty much the average. It's going to be 30, 30 minutes to an hour per class. So I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in class two when we cover score sheets.